All right. So we are going to dive into really like our front end module where we're going to be learning a lot more about using JavaScript on the front end with a very popular framework called React.js. Uh, we're going to learn more about HTML, HTML and CSS as well. But what we're going to see is that there's um, a lot of tooling in the JavaScript ecosystem. And so we're going to talk about uh, Node.js and NPM, the Node Package Manager. We're going to see how to create an NPM project uh, and its skeleton, especially this particular file named package.json. Um, just like we can install Python dependencies with pip, we'll see how to do that with NPM. Um, we'll learn about what's called NPM scripts. We'll learn about how to import in JavaScript because there's an old way and new way to do it. Uh, we'll review some really common uh, programming techniques with JavaScript that use some things that we're familiar with, but that are much more common in JavaScript, mapping and filtering and, and destructuring. And that will come up a ton in React. And we'll use this um, library called Axios that's very similar to Fetch that you learned a bit last week. Um, and then in part two of the lecture, we're going to dive into starting to get our hands dirty with uh, React.js and uh, what's called a build tool Vt and basically creating our first React project. Uh, do folks have any questions before we dive in? Okay, awesome. So here in the command line, um, I'm gonna make a new directory and we're just gonna call it my project. And I'm going to go ahead and navigate inside there. And um, I'm going to go ahead and create a readme just so we have it as a reference point. Um, and so this readme out here, this one is sort of for the whole lesson. My project is going to be our root directory, our project root directory as we talk about um, NPM. And I added the, the readme in there for that reason. And let's go ahead and just put that there just so we have it as a, a reference as we do stuff. So NPM stands for Node Package Manager. If I use the which command, I can confirm that it is indeed installed, which it should be for all of us. And if I do NPM dash V, I'm passing it the dash V flag for version. I can see what version of Node Package Manager I have installed. Um, and if we go online real quick, and I'll close out some of these older things that we don't need, and we go to npm JS, just like we can go to the site PyPy with pip, um, we can see uh, the website that has a list of all the different JavaScript packages, which is sort of similar to Python modules. If I want to share my JavaScript code with you, these days I will probably do it as an NPM package. Um, and we can find React.js. And if I could, if it would just let us click on it. And we can see here um, the GitHub repo. We can see it has 23 million weekly downloads. Uh, what version it's on, and a, a quick little hello world here of, of how to use it. And uh, what we'll use a bit later in the lesson too is a package called fetch, um, or excuse me, called Axios, that is very similar to fetch for making HTTP requests. And again, we can see it's quite popular. It's got almost 50 million weekly downloads. And um, in fact, we see a whole ton of documentation here that's probably being pulled from their GitHub. And just, this is always a good thing to do um, as you work more and more with NPM packages and other code. My, my rule of thumb is I call it like level one, like we'll learn more about Axios later and go deeper into it. But if I'm using a new package, I like to just go to its GitHub or NPM JS to skim it and see that it exists. Um, and let's go ahead, in fact, and um, 
let's install this package Axios that we'll learn to use later. But before that, let's actually run this command npm init and see what it does and talk about it. So when I'm creating a JavaScript project, I need to be able to install packages and control what versions of packages are installed. That's what the node package manager does. Um, and as you can see from this message, it's going to walk us through creating a special file named package.json, which is just a JSON text file, but that's what NPM uses. And it's sort of like requirements.txt that you all have seen with pip, but on steroids. Um, so I can give it a package name right here, but if I just hit enter, it will use, uh, I will look at the current directory that I'm in. If I want to, I can give it a specific version, but it will just use what's in parentheses as default. Same with description. I could give it a description if I want, but I don't really care. Entry point, we'll talk about a bit later, but this is very much like runner.py with Python, where this is the JavaScript file that we might import other JavaScript code into and is going to sort of be our main method, so to speak, or our main file that we run. Um, it's often called index.js. Sometimes it's called app.js. I'll leave it as index.js for now. Uh, and the rest of this, I'm going to leave empty, uh, but we could add if we wanted later, and it's not so important because you can see keyword, author, license, stuff like that. And we're getting a little preview of what's about to be created. And is it okay? I can just hit enter. And now uh, that package.json has been created for us. So this has done a lot of things for us. We have a project name. We have a project version. If I want it, I have a description of my project. And in fact, I can modify this package.json file just like any other JSON file um, and add whatever we want. Um, this main, and we can see here these key value pairs. And let me move my mouse out of the way so that we're not getting the hovering. Uh, we can see these key value pairs just like with any other JSON file, right? This text file in a special format, JavaScript object notation, JSON. Um, and we can modify this as much as we want. Main is important um, because we're going to see a little bit later that we can run scripts to do certain commands for us. And one of them will be to actually run the program and it will look at whatever file we uh, set as the value for this main property in package.json. Scripts we're going to learn about in a bit. These are commands that we can actually run from the command line using NPM. And we can see that right now, this test script doesn't do a lot. It says echo, which I, we know on the command line, if I type echo, error, no test specified, um, it just prints that. And in fact, if I add the rest of what we see in that test command, it just ends the terminal process, which doesn't make a lot of sense for us to do, but does if we run it as an NPM script. And so what I can do is I can do NPM run test. And uh, I'm getting an error right now because, in fact, I have to navigate back into my project directory. Um, so I didn't do this on purpose, but this is a good error message to see. There's a lot of stuff here, but this is the important part. Could not read package.json, no such file or directory, right? So there's certain NPM commands um, like npm run, where it's looking for a package.json because it's going to then look for those scripts. So let me go ahead and navigate into my project. And now let me go ahead and run test. And we see here some information about the script and this message error, no test specified. Um, I can add my own NPM scripts if I want. And in fact, let's just add one here that says, hello, just for fun. And 
And now if I do npm run hello, we'll see that hello message. And we'll see that um, as we our JavaScript projects get more complex, sort of the norm is we always want to use npm scripts for a lot of stuff. Um, npm gives us some helpers. For instance, the test command is so common that I don't have to type run. I could just type npm test and it still does it. But if there are only a couple special script names like test and we'll see there's um, start is another one. If I try npm hello, um, I'll get an error, unknown command, hello, did I mean this? npm run hello, run the hello package script, right? And now if, if I do npm run hello, it should work just fine. And so we'll see more, but here in this package.json, this scripts property, it's another JSON object, and we can add commands here, basically, that we can run from NPM on the command line. Um, and this becomes very useful as our, our programs get bigger. Um, so that's sort of a brief preview of, of package.json and, and walking through what we have here. There are a couple more things that we're going to add to it in, in just a minute, but I wanted to sort of do a bit of a walkthrough. Uh, so I just want to pause and and check in and see if folks have uh, any questions. And also, how are we doing in terms of like lag with audio and video? Is it okay? Okay, perfect, awesome. All right, so we learned um, a couple important commands: npm init to create a new npm project. And by the way, I'm going to run npm init dash dash help because somewhere in here should be. And actually, let me double check the command. Uh, there is a command that we can run and I'll find later that skips the sort of command line prompting. I think it's dash y. Can you do it? Yeah, I think you're correct because dash y for yes. Yeah, exactly. So let's let's in, so you never would want to make an npm project inside another one. But just for demonstration purposes, if I do npm init dash y. Note that it creates a new package JSON, but skips all the command line prompting. So that's useful to know as, as well. Uh, usually what I just do, to be honest, is I just do npm init and I just hit enter like four or five times. So we've seen that there's some npm commands that are specific to the package.json file, namely um, the, the npm run that looks for these scripts. Let's look at a couple other npm commands that are really useful. Uh, probably the most useful is the install command. And let's go ahead and install this um, npm package Axios that we'll use later and, and see what happens. So, I ran npm install Axios, and I do have to be in the project directory to do this. If I navigate outside of that directory, um, this will work, but what it does is it creates a new package.json, right? So if I run npm install somewhere where a package.json file doesn't exist, it will actually create one for me. So I, it, it is important to make sure you're in the right directory so that stuff is installed in the right place, which is different than a Python virtual environment, right? And 
you know, a common question is, and maybe someone can answer this for me. If I have my Python virtual environment activated like I do now, does that interfere with uh, NPM and installing JavaScript packages and stuff like that? A little bit of a trick question, because um, it's not, I, I know that we're still learning about all this stuff. The answer, thankfully, is no. Um, the Python virtual environment, virtual environment is really kind of a fancy term. It doesn't interfere with anything else. All it does is affect when we install a Python dependency, like it gets installed to that virtual environment directory and where it looks for stuff. So I can have my Python virtual environment activated or deactivated and all my non-Python stuff doesn't care. So let's take a look at what happened when I ran uh, this install Axios command. A couple things happened. Note that this package.json file changed. NPM did that for us. There's now this property dependencies that has a JSON object and we see Axios listed here. And so this is the name of the NPM package that we installed and the particular version. Um, and I'd have to look it up, but this caret means uh, like rules around if we're installing this, I believe it's like you can install version 1.7.3 or four or five, um, but not version 1.8. Uh, I don't, I don't want to get into it too much now, but it's called uh, semantic versioning. And we'll talk about it more uh, a, a bit later, I think. So a couple other things happened when I ran npm install. Uh, this directory node modules did not exist before. Uh, you'll often hear um, npm modules, node modules, same same thing. And if we look inside here, there's actually a whole bunch of stuff now that's been installed, right? Even though all I did was install Axios, which we can see right here. Um, and I don't want to get too deep into it, but the sort of the way that all these JavaScript libraries work is they're also NPM packages. So inside this node modules directory, I could go to Axios, I could go to package.json here. And if I scroll all the way down, there's a list of dependencies. There's also dev dependencies, which are dependencies that uh, first say developing it. And we see that these got installed as well. This NPM package named follow redirects, one named form data, one named proxy from ENV. And if I looked inside here, there would also be a package.json that would have some dependencies as well. So when I'm installing you know, one known module, it could have a bunch of dependencies that also have a bunch of dependencies. And so a bunch of node modules get installed into this node modules directory. Um, but all that our project requires is Axios, right? Axios requires all this other stuff, but we only care about Axios. So we don't have to worry about what Axios depends on, what Axios's dependencies are. And that's why here in this package.json, it's just Axios. But you know, we kind of do have to care because I don't want Axios to break. Like what happens if a different version of this follow redirects library comes out and it doesn't work with Axios or something like that. Um, you don't want that to happen. So what has been added to NPM for a while now is this file package-lock.json that also gets created. And you can see here, all of the node modules, right? So here's the one I installed, but all the node modules that Axios depends on also got installed. And all the node modules that they depend on got installed. And this file tracks all of the specific versions of those things. And this way, we'll see in a moment how I can guarantee that every time I want to install the dependencies for my project, I always get 
basically the exact same version of everything. And you should never touch the node modules directory directly or package.lock.json directly. They're really meant to be managed by NPM. That said, the nice thing about package.json and package.lock.json is if I go ahead and delete node modules and I run npm install, uh, anyone guess what this install command is gonna do? S semi Semi trick question. Uh, Eric, yes, sir. Uh, would it install all dependent dependencies if you didn't already have them? Yeah, exactly. NPM install is going to look for a package lock JSON file and install all of these dependencies. If that package lock JSON doesn't exist for some reason, it'll look at package.json. So every now and then you might something might get wonky and you might need to delete the node modules directory and that's fine. And, and you might even need to delete the package lock JSON directory, though this should not be a normal activity, but every now and then it does happen. And that's okay too, because when I run NPM install, if package lock JSON was there, it would look and it would install the specific versions of all those things but I deleted that one. So instead it's gonna look in package.json, it's gonna look for dependencies, it's gonna install Axios, and then it's gonna look inside the package lock, inside the package JSON file for Axios and install all of those dependencies and so on for each of those until all of these packages have all their dependencies installed. So what I do, is when I'm working on a project, I don't want to put the node modules directory in GitHub. And I'm going to create a .git ignore file, which we can use to tell Git to ignore a certain directory. And I'm a bunch of levels deep because I'm in the demos and notes repo right now. So it's adding all this stuff. Um, so we don't actually see it as well as I'd, I'd like us to. But um, uh, one moment, Chris. But um, what git ignore does is if I do git add dot and I do git status, Git ignore has been added. The readme has been added. Package JSON, package lock has been added, but node modules has not. And the reason that I don't want to add it is because uh, it takes up more space on GitHub for one thing. Like there's going to be a ton of dependencies that's installed. But more importantly, I don't want the node modules directory to be my source of truth. I actually want like package lock json or package.json to be my sources of truth so that let's say you clone my repo you run npm install you it goes to package lock json and then it installs those versions of those things um because without getting into it too much what semantic versioning does with the sort of the caret and the 1.7 dot so on it lets us set rules so that like if version 1.8 of Axios is released, NPM will install that, but it won't go up to version two because that might break. So if there's say like a bug fix, that way we get it when we run NPM install. So the golden rule is, is basically don't check node modules into version control, but do check uh, package JSON and package lock.json into version control. And Chris, yes, sir. And thank you for being patient. That was my question about the git and nor. So, but yeah, I just had to wait. Sorry. Perfect timing. Um, and this is a good point to pause and check in and see if folks have questions as well. Uh, Cody, yes, sir. 
Yeah, what'd you put in get ignored? Just node underscore modules. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you don't have to put a lot in there. Let me pull it back up again. All right, slash. All right, thank you. Yeah, you don't actually need the slash. I like to do it because uh, it reminds me that it's a directory. You can put file names there as well. I wouldn't want to put that file name there, but just as an example. Um, so I don't actually need the slash, but I, I like to do it. So when I look at the docket ignore file, it's easy for me to see what's a directory. And you can actually have like multiple docket ignore files and you can actually have like relative paths in the get ignore file to different files and stuff. So it's, it's quite useful. Yeah, great, great question. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. So let's see, we've talked about package.json. Uh, we've talked about package lock.json. Um, then they're both important and should be checked into to version control. Um, let's go ahead and talk a bit more about project structure and start to add some code. And to help me do this, I'm going to copy over um, a file that we'll need from the curriculum. And actually, as long as I'm doing this, I might as well just, just show everyone so we can all see that just where this stuff is. Um, if you go into the curriculum for today's lesson, there are these two directories, number guessing and to-do list. And these have the demo code uh, that I'll be using for a lot of today. So uh, that code is already there in the in the curriculum. Uh, and I'll be kind of putting it into demos and notes as well. And what I'm about to grab is there's a, a JSON file with some task information. And I'm about to grab that and install that. And I'm going to take a quick peek here to see if there's anything else that we need. Um, and let me go ahead and copy the file that I want over. So give me just a moment to um, put together the path that I want. Okay, so now that tasks.json file has been copied over. Um, and we'll start doing stuff with it in just a minute. Let me close uh, some of this stuff out so it, it's not there and it's not bothering us. And let me close out these things that we no longer need. And let's quickly come back to um, package.json uh, just to talk a little bit more about scripts. So we're not, we haven't written any tests yet, but we might want to later. Right, and if you all remember from week one, Jest is, is the testing library that's very popular in JavaScript. So let's go ahead and install that. But I'm going to add this flag, save dev, because it doesn't matter now, but later on when we get to deployment um, and you know, keeping track of what JavaScript code we need to have in the user's browser for the front end app and which we just need for development, this is useful, right? Because you don't need to have just the, all that JavaScript code in the user's browser. That's just for us. And we'll learn more about this later, but there are ways to tell um, NPM when we're installing stuff, if it should install what are called de developer development dependencies or not. Right, because again, I don't actually need Jest to run my program, but it is a dependency for tests if we choose to write them. And now that I have Jest installed, let's let's just update this script to use it. Now it's not going to do anything because we don't even have any tests. And in fact, if I run npm test, it's probably just going to give me an error. And it does because there's no test directory, but that's okay. Um. 
what might be a little more useful with the script is something to run our main program. And we set that main file to be index.js, which actually at the moment doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and, and create index.js. And the name index comes from like the index.html file, which traditionally was like the very first HTML page for a website that was loaded that had the list of all the other links. So you'll see index.js or app.js used uh, interchangeably. And let's just put a, a hello world message in there. And just as a, a, as a reminder, I use the node command to run JavaScript on the command line. But NPM will do this for us, which becomes more and more useful as we start to use other JavaScript libraries with our JavaScript code. So in fact, what I want to do here, and I think I'm just gonna order this stuff alphabetically. Um, I found that that's actually the easiest and the best way to do this is I'm going to add a script named start, which is a, a convention. Uh, it's very common to see NPM scripts named start that run your main JavaScript file. So just like test has a shortcut, I can do NPM run start, which will now run that command, or I can just type NPM start because we're going to be using this command all the time. And I, I do want you all to start getting in the habit of, of using NPM to run programs and, and creating a start script. And as we'll see in a bit with B, it's going to do it, it for us. So we've got our our JavaScript hooked up to NPM now. I can run it with NPM. Let's go ahead and let's start adding some code. And I'm just going to add a little comment here just as a reminder to me. Um, I think I'll leave this hello world there just to help me debug as I go. Um, we need to import that JSON data that we have here in tasks.json. Right, I have this file over here that has JSON data, and this is all in the root directory of my project. So all of these are on the same level. So there's two ways to import stuff in JavaScript. Um, the old way that I'm going to show you now is called a, a, a common JS module. The new way that's better that you'll be using probably for the majority of the course is um, what's called an ES6 module just to make life more confusing. Um, and without going too much into JavaScript history, because JavaScript is so popular and huge, uh, the reason there's two systems is because for a while, the new way was not supported everywhere, but now it basically is. So the old way looks like this. We use a command named require, and this literally will run whatever JavaScript is in this file and return whatever is returned. And note that I give it a relative path. And because this is a JSON file, require will take that JSON. And let me go ahead and make a split here so we can see this. Require is going to take this JSON, turn it into a JavaScript object, and, um, and then return that so it'll get assigned to this variable tasks. So then if I print out tasks, uh, fingers crossed, we'll see all these tasks printed out. And I'm going to do it this way with npm start. And indeed, I see all of, the, all of this stuff printed out. So this is the old way of importing with common JS modules. Don't do this. Every now and then there, there's a JavaScript library where for reasons not worth going into, you will have to. 
but in general, it should be avoided and you won't need to do it. There's a couple extra steps we have to do to import stuff the new way, but let's let's get started. I can use the import command. I can give what I'm importing a name um, if it doesn't have one, and I can give it a relative path to where I'm getting the stuff that I want. And there's gonna be a couple of errors that pop up that we'll fix as we go, but let's watch what, what happens. So there's this syntax error, cannot use import statements outside a module. Um, again, once we get into V, you all won't have to do this manually, but this is important to know. It's a really common gotcha. We have to tell NPM we're importing stuff the new way um, with, with ES6 modules. And so I have to go here into my package.json and I can add it anywhere really, but I, I recommend just adding it near the top. And note as I'm typing this VS code gives me some autocomplete um, that tells us actually this is exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna set this type to module so that NPM treats all the JavaScript files as, as ES6 modules. And if we don't set type to module, it uses the old way by default. So again, the good news here is that we're gonna learn a bit later some tools that will do most of this work for us. And let me see, I made a simple typo here, which is why I'm seeing the squiggly. I put the semicolon inside the double quotes. And now that squiggly has gone and we're good to go. And there might be one or two more things that we need to, to fix, but let's see if this fixes this one error. So this is good. We we got a new error now. Um, this error says import assertion type missing. Uh, there's a whole lot of stuff here, but if we read the first two lines of this error message, we see module file, blah, 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 tasks.json needs an import attribute of type JSON. And this is actually a, a good thing and a newer feature to import modules where if we're not importing JavaScript, we need to tell it what type of data is being imported so that so that Node.js and, and JavaScript know what to do with it. And this really only comes up, um, it mainly comes up with JSON. I, I need to check, to be honest, if it comes up with CSS files or stuff like that, but we'll get into that later. And so what I do here is in my import statement, I add this uh, bit assert, and then inside an object, I say, type JSON. And now finally we can run this and we're good to go. And I do get this warning. You're gonna get a lot of warnings with Node.js and NPM and React. Just ignore them for the most part. Read them every now and then a warning might be important, but most of the time you can ignore this. Um, Importing JSON modules is an experimental feature. It is, I don't know how long it's been experimental for, but probably at least a year. So this is not that relevant for us. Um, in general, you can ignore warnings. Uh, Len, yes, sir. So when you say you can ignore running, you're only talking about JavaScript and only with like what we're doing right now, right? Not like ignoring warnings in general for all languages, just to be clear. Uh, to be honest, you can probably ignore warnings in general um, for all languages. It's It, it, it obviously depends a little bit, but um, there's a reason that something is a warning and not an error. The warnings no. are more informational. No, no, that's the word. Never mind. Yeah. As I was, as yeah. I was. No, great was. question. Great, and and honestly, a very understandable question too. The warnings, like, if we had some big, you know, if we were working for Amazon, right, where if if the website breaks, it's a big problem. Maybe we don't want to use this 
because it's more work to keep track of what happens. Like you have to be on the email list and stuff. And so we want to be really conservative and, and not use experimental features. But if we're like a scrappy little startup may, and, and we don't have a ton of code, maybe we want to use the newest and hottest thing because we like it and it makes our lives easier. So warnings are really informational. Yeah, great question. And actually, this is a good pausing point to see if folks have, have questions or things on their mind. Okay, awesome. Um, without going too deep into it, here are a couple reasons why the new way of importing ES6 modules is better. Uh, for one thing, I think the syntax is easier and nicer to read. For another, it lets you do things like assert to check the, the, the type of data you're importing if it's not JavaScript, which makes it easier to catch errors. Um, there's also things that um, like things like something called tree shaking and, and stuff that I don't want to get too deep into where it lets us like basically compress the JavaScript code when we actually send it to the user's uh, browser more. Basically it helps us keep track of like, what do we really need and what do we not need? We'll see later, I can import, I can export multiple things from here and just import the bits I want with ES6 modules. And that's harder to do with the, the old way. Um, also, this is now standard everywhere, including in, in browsers. And, and it's just gonna become more and more the standard moving forward. So this is definitely the, the way to do it. Okay. Um, how are folks doing? Has this been sort of a good review slash intro to NPM and, and Node.js projects? Awesome. We're gonna switch gears a bit and do a bit of JavaScript coding. Some of this will be review. Um, some of this will be newer stuff. Um, and I think what we'll do because I the the assignments that we have for today are a bit more geared towards um stuff when we cover React is um I don't think there's a good hands-on workshop for today, but I'll try to make it more interactive and uh we'll we'll take breaks. And in fact, we're almost at like uh 950 now. Uh how how do folks feel about just taking a 10 minute break now and then we can kind of dive into the next part when we come back? Perfect. All right. Let's uh, take 10 or 11 minutes, depending on what your clock is, right on the hour at uh, 10 o'clock central. We will pick this up and we're going to look at filtering, mapping, using these features of the JavaScript language and going through it, and then maybe even making some uh, API calls with Axios. So thank you very much, everyone. And I'll, I'll see you all in 10 minutes. All right, so we've covered a lot about like NPM, the node package manager and, and node projects, right? And package.json and NPM init and, and that all important um, scripts in the package.json file that we can add. So I can do NPM start, right? And it runs the script that I created that runs my index.js file. And we learned about importing and using the new way and, and not the old way, uh, which I'll leave there just for historical purposes, but we know that we don't want to do. Um, actually, I think I'll just remove this just for, for readability. And we have this the, these tasks that we've now imported and I could have named this whatever I want. It's what's called a default import when I'm just importing one thing. Um, we'll we'll kind of learn more about different ways to import stuff later. But um, if only one thing can be exported from a file, which is the case with, with a JSON file, then this is what's called the default import. And I can actually name it whatever I want. 
um, and it works just fine. But for kind of readability for other programmers, you know, having the name be tasks makes a lot of sense because it's the tasks coming from a file named tasks.json. Let's do some stuff with tasks. Um, and what I want to do is I want to use javascripts.map and I want to use javascripts.filter. I don't think we're going to look at reduce later, but that's another tool in the toolbox. Um, so I've got this JavaScript object, right? It's an array of objects and JavaScript objects are kind of different from Python objects, right? A JavaScript object is a lot more like, say a Python dictionary. It's very flexible. If we print out the first item in this array of tasks, we'll see one JavaScript object. And it's uh, there's a bunch of other junk uh, point that that I should look up. I'm sure there's a way to get rid of these messages. But we see right here the uh, the one JavaScript object printed out. Um, can someone remind me, like if I just want to get if I don't want you know the ID, the task, and if it's completed or not, what if I just want a list of like all of the task names, for example? Um, how can I do that? And maybe use dot map to do that. Can anyone remind me what does dot map do in, in JavaScript? I know this is feels like a million years ago from week one. Brandon, yes, sir. Does it do something to each element of your iterable data structure and then return a new data structure? That is exactly what it does. Yes, oh, that was a great yeah. breakdown. So map, the idea is, I guess if you think about like mapping one thing to another, it, it's, I think, maybe a little bit of a math term. Map goes through each element in my array. It does something to it, and it returns it back, and I get a whole new array. Cody, yes, sir. Is it map like a dictionary, or, or how do you... I just remember, I think for map, you have to... Like the first map has reference to the next key, has reference to the next key, right? Is that is that correct? Um, possibly. There are a number of things that we can do with it, but that you may be thinking of something else. I'm not. I'm not certain. Um, okay. Eric. All right. Thanks. No, no, no. Uh, it's a good question, and I just may have misunderstood. Eric, yes, sir. I, I think Cody was thinking about the reduce method, um, but DOM map is an array method. Um, and are you looking for like creating a new object with just, I don't remember which key you wanted, or were you looking for like a list? Yeah. Of... Let's, yeah, that's a good question. And let's, let's in fact build it out now and, and see what it looks like. I, I think that'll be the, the easiest way to uh, address your point. Um, so map and filter, and and we, you know, Python has these as well. Uh, in JavaScript, map and filter, they're um, functions that exist on, on arrays. So I call the dot map function on this uh, array. Um, and I pass it another function as an argument. And I'm going to pass it an arrow function. And just as a very quick reminder, an arrow function, it's sort of a very similar idea to a Python Lambda. It's an anonymous function. You can write it in one line and it can look something like this.
And I am just going to run code this way to get rid of those extra things. And I'm probably getting the error from the dot map because I haven't added anything to it. And if I scroll all the way up here, we get my hello message. Um, so an arrow function, if it's just one line, I don't need the curly brackets. If it's maybe more than one line, I do need the curly brackets. Maybe we want to have it look like this instead. Maybe I want to pass in an argument name. And maybe instead of printing it, I want to do something like this, where I'm going to construct a message with uh, a tagged template literal, which is JavaScript's version of an F string that looks like this. And say, hello, person, and return the message. Now, I could do this all in one line. I, I am doing this in two lines for demonstration purposes for arrow functions. And now when I call say hi, it will return this message. And it would help if I passed in an argument. That's why we see undefined here. And so now I have an arrow function that, that does some work for me, right? So arrow functions are really useful because they're just more succinct. And so for stuff like dot map, it's really nice to write arrow functions. And when I'm passing in an arrow function to dot map, it always takes as an argument uh, each thing in the list. This is going to go through the whole list and pass in each item in my list. So this gets passed into dot map first. This gets passed in second. And what this function is supposed to do is return an object. And so let's say I want to make a new object and have it or let's say I don't want an object at all. Let's say I just want to return the name of the task. And I believe it's task.task. .task. So this is going to give me, instead of an array of objects, an array of strings with my task names. And let's run this and, and see what this looks like. And it would help if I didn't have typos in my code. So let's see what I got wrong here. Um, I'm so used to writing Python. I forgot that I need to define variables with const or let in JavaScript. Uh, let start with const. Let is if I know I'm going to change the value of a variable. And now this runs and, and, and it works. And what I can see right here is now I have an array of task names. And this is really useful, right? Because maybe I want to show this to the user. Maybe I want to do something else with it. Um, map is very useful. And what I haven't done is modified the original array. I've created a whole new one. Because if I print out tasks here, I see here all this stuff is printed out that that is still tasks. So that's just sort of a review of, of dot map and, and what it can be useful for. Um, let's break this down even a bit more. Does anyone remember object destructuring from JavaScript? We saw this a little, but not a lot. Uh, Brandon, yes, sir. I believe it's object dot entries, but you have to call, yeah, you have to call object dot your object and then dot entries, something along those lines. It's a, it's a few extra steps in JavaScript. 
Yeah, you are totally correct that that is um, one way to do it. Um, there's a couple different ways to do uh, object destructuring in, in JavaScript. And I think, and I'm kind of looking over notes here to make sure that I demonstrate the right one that I want. Um, we can totally do object.entries. Um, another way to destructure objects specific to say functions is actually in the, the function argument. What I can actually do, and this is sort of syntactical sugar, is right here, if I'm passing in an object as an argument, I can say the properties of that object. And JavaScript will do the destructuring for me right here. And I'll add some console logs just just so we can see stuff. And you're gonna be seeing this syntax a lot as we get into React because we're gonna be doing a lot of passing objects as arguments, but I only maybe, I, I really wanna just use the properties of that object. so. I can use this sort of syntactic sugar to destructure this object to create variables for each of its properties. So that I don't have to do, you know, const ID equals task.id or const completed equals task.completed. Right? I could do it this way. This does the exact same thing, but JavaScript has given us some syntactic sugar to make our lives a little easier. So instead of doing this, I can do this. And let's just run this code to, to see that it works. And, and um, I'll make this a bit bigger here. And we can see indeed our code does work and we can see this statement printed out. And in fact, cause all I care about here in this dot map is the task. The console log was really just to help demonstrate the concept. I don't even need to put these other properties there. I can destructure and only grab the property that I care about for a very succinct notation. So that's um, one way of doing object destructuring in JavaScript, and you will see a ton of it in, in React. So we want to kind of introduce it to you all now. Um, and I just want to pause and check in and see if folks have any questions. I know that the syntax takes a little bit of time to get used to, especially between arrow functions and destructuring and stuff. Um, but I just want to check in and confirm that everyone's feeling okay about the concept itself. And let me pull that off of the main screen and just double check our x-ray questions channel. Okay. Awesome. So it, it, it gets even more succinct. Um, I, I won't do it too much now, but you can, you could turn this into a one line statement. Um, I think I'll, I'll, sh I'll very briefly show that just so we can see it. So you might see something like this. Because for arrow functions, if it's just one line, I don't actually need the return statement. So this is where the syntax starts to get really nice. 
Uh, this I know is a little more foreign, and I, I'm going to mostly demonstrate this stuff uh, the more verbose way. But this is kind of where we're going and ending up, because once you start writing code like this, all of a sudden you have like this very succinct, very powerful one line command. And in fact, I think maybe what I'll do is we'll put it there. And what we'll do here is we'll I'll have both of them, both of them there. Um, the main thing with arrow functions is if it's multiple lines, you need the curly brackets. So let's talk about filter. And can someone remind me what does this filter method do to an array? Um, Eric, yes, sir. So it'll do the same thing where it'll look at each uh, value in the array and it'll return a new array of all the items that pass whatever test you give the filter function. Yeah, exactly. So let's say I want a list of all of my completed tasks. I can do tasks.filter and just like with dot map, we have to pass it a function. I could actually create the function here. You know, if I wanted to do like uh, is completed task, I could do something like like this. And I could pass that in. And let me go ahead and comment out the, the stuff that, that we don't need here so we don't get a ton of, of print statements. Right, filter takes in a function as an argument. This should work just fine for us. And if I scroll up through my, my output now, I see indeed I only got the completed tasks. Uh, this function has to return a Boolean and that's how filter decides if it should keep something in the array or not. Since completed is already a Boolean, I just need to return that. And again, the tasks array itself is not modified. Filter returns a new array. So filter um, filters out items in array we don't want and returns a new array with the ones we do. And it does that by having a function that returns a Boolean true or false. And it keeps the ones where we return true and returns the ones where it's false. So, you know, it it wouldn't make sense to write it this way. Um, Cause this is way too much work for something that we're already doing, but just to make, to lay out the logic, right? This is what this filter function needs to do is return true or false. But since, completed is already a Boolean, we can just do that. And again, let's do some object destruction here, just, just for fun and to get practice at this. And if I run my code again, I see that I forgot to change something here. And in fact, I had a squiggly, so I can go ahead and, and fix that. And I, in fact, see task is not defined and it pointed me right to the line in my code that had the error. And we see the completed tasks. And again, this tasks array has not been modified. If I printed this out, we would see all the tasks. So again, I've got some object destructuring here. Um, 
And in fact, instead of a function, let's make this an arrow function so we can get more used to this syntax. And we can see it put right here. And in fact, let's make this a really succinct arrow function. Let's make it a one-liner like we know, like we learned that we can do. And it looks like I don't even need the parentheses. Um, and in fact, this is now so succinct that I might as well just put it right in here. And it looks like I maybe need a closing parentheses. I see my syntax there. I forgot the argument I pass into my arrow function does need to be wrapped in parentheses, especially if I'm doing object destructuring. And now if I run this code, we get a list of completed tasks. And so this is why like map and filter and this arrow function syntax are so powerful because all of a sudden I have like this very succinct line of code. Um, and I could do the same thing for incomplete tasks. Or let's just say not completed tasks. And can someone maybe tell me how would I have to change this arrow function to get a list of tasks that are, are not completed? Any guesses? Any thoughts? I think. Oh, oh um, uh, Murad, go for it, and, and then Earl John, uh, I'll check in with you as well. I, I think I'm gonna flag it to uh, false. Yeah, exactly. We can just add the exclamation point to flip it to false. And er Earl John, uh, what, what were you going to say as as well? I was just about to do the same thing. Love it. I love it. Great minds. Yeah, exactly. We can just add that exclamation point. That's the Boolean that flips this from true to false. And now I've got my completed tasks and my not completed tasks. And I can see the two lists here. Where this stuff starts to get really cool is let's say that now that I have my completed and not completed tasks, um, let's say, I just want the task names. Well, let me go ahead and just do some more filtering. Um, and I used const here. So I, I need to, I think I'm just going to do another const and we'll call it not completed names. And we'll do not completed tasks. And can someone help me out? How can I use dot map to just get a list of the names? Well, what needs to go inside dot map here? Like, what should I pass it? A variable, a Boolean, a string? A function, right? Let's pass it an arrow function. It's going to take in a task as an argument. And what do we want it to return? We want it to return the task name. And we've seen object destructuring in action. So let's do it right here. And let's print not completed task. Uh, not completed names. And so fingers crossed, I don't have an error. If we do, we'll see and we can debug it. And indeed, there is something that I got wrong. Um, let's see what my issue is. Name is not defined. Ah, very simple mistake on my part, because I just keep thinking task name. But that's 
our property is actually named task inside that task object, right? And in fact, VS Code was giving me a hint there. And so now if I run this, I get a list of not completed names. And we can do the same thing here, in fact, right? Let's do const completed names equals completed tasks dot filter, or I'm so sorry, dot map. And let's create our arrow function and do a little destructuring to get task and return that. And let's print that out here. And now all of a sudden, I have a list of, I have the, all the names of the completed tasks and the not completed tasks. And I still have the original list of tasks if I want to do stuff with it. Right, that original task list has not been modified. I've created two new arrays. And I think the last thing I want to show with this before we move on is, is what's called method chaining, where because this returns an array, and then I call another array function on my array, JavaScript has given us a very nice syntax to combine these together. So I don't have to do multiple lines of, of code. And let me close this out because we don't need this right now. And I'll call this not completed names. So this looks like a lot, but I'm calling dot filter and it's returning something. And then JavaScript says, oh, okay, we've returned an array. And oh, I see you want me to find that property not completed and, uh, and call dot map on it. Actually, let me fix my syntax here. So it should look like this. So I called dot filter on it. And then I call dot map on what the filter returns. And I can chain these methods together. And what you'll often see, because unlike Python, JavaScript doesn't care about like spaces and indentation for code correctness, is you'll often see this code written like this. And if I always think of it as like, again, my data is flowing through a series of tubes. We filter it and then we run dot map. And so this is a bit more complicated in terms of syntax because there's more going on. But again, it gives us this really powerful, succinct way of, of doing stuff. And there's nothing wrong with doing it the more verbose way. And in fact, I would encourage you all to do it if you're more comfortable with it. Um, as you read and write more JavaScript code with React.js, you will see more JavaScript code like this. So we want to introduce it to you all. And I just want to pause and check in and see if folks have um, any questions or if there's stuff that'd be good for us to review. Because at this point, we are going to switch gears and start talking about Axios and, and making API calls kind of like we did with Fetch last week. So this is a good touch point before we move on. Is everyone feeling good? Is this mostly review to folks? Is this new stuff? Okay, awesome. Let's take five. Um, since we are going to switch topics and then we'll start talking about, um, Axios and, and the Pokemon API and using Axios. And then we'll also look at React and, um, the, and, and see React JS that we're going to be using for the next week, um, and do a little coding together. And I think we can wrap a little early so that you all can have a, a little time to get started on the assignments. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, and I'll see you all in five minutes. Yeah, Adam. Yes, sir, what's up?
Yeah, I had a, a quick question. Yeah. Uh, big, big, big picture. So this is basically going to teach us how to track tasks that we want to do in our, like, so yeah, like in like 30 seconds, big picture, what is this doing for us in our software engineering development life cycle? Got it. So JavaScript can be used for kind of your backend server code, but that's not how we're using it in this course. We're using it with React.js to build the user interface that's going to run in the browser. So let's say we're building a full stack web app and let's say instead of tasks, it's like a recipe list and the user logs in and wants to see like um, a list of, of all the recipes that, that, that they've added or that are there. Um, we're going to see in a minute how to use Axios just like with fetch so that the user's browser with the JavaScript code that we write running inside the user's browser, we'll grab that data from the server. What we're learning now with dot map and dot filter is like, Hey, I have that data about recipes and it's a bunch of JavaScript objects. Um, but you know, I don't want to show the user like the IDs for those recipes and maybe like metadata. So maybe we want to use dot map so that we only get that stuff that we're actually going to show you know, in the browser screen to the user. And let's say then the user only wants to see their like favorited recipes that they've starred. And just like with tasks completed, that could be a Boolean as well. So they click a button that says only show me my, my favorite recipes. And we run a bit of JavaScript code that does a filter to only show those. Does that, was that good too much? Not enough? Oh, yeah. I could I use some, some feedback. Yeah, that was perfect. Thanks. Yeah, it makes sense. It's basically data manipulation for front end since I guess we're doing front end this week. So yeah, that answered it. Thank you very much. Yeah, exactly, man. Good, good, good question. You hit the, you hit the nail on the head. Data, data manipulation, which we, we need to do on the back end too. But since we're using JavaScript with React for the front end, that's where you'll be using the, the, these particular things more often. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Hey folks, let's uh, start to reconvene.
All right. How's everyone doing? Um, I saw some thumbs up before with that stuff, and, and it would just help me to, to understand and to make sure that I'm tracking. Was that a lot of review of things that we've seen, or was there some new stuff introduced there? What If it was review, was it useful? A little bit of this, a little bit of that, and yes, it was useful. Okay, awesome. Glad to hear. And it's just, again, helpful because I know we introduced this stuff in, in week one and you all got some hands-on time with it. But I also know that we've been doing a ton of Python until last week, basically, when we kind of switched back to JS. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. And uh, I apologize. I actually forgot to pause the recording. So we're still rolling, but I think that we're good to go. Um, and someone actually had a great question, which was like, hey, how is this stuff being used? And I gave a long answer and then Cody did a great job of summarizing it. Uh, this is all gonna help us manipulate data on the front end for the, the user interface in, in the browser that we're gonna build. So we've covered a lot of ground, right? We've covered Node and NPM, creating an NPM project, package.json, uh, installing dependencies, the package.json and package lock JSON file, scripts, how to import stuff, and we just kind of did a pretty not solid walkthrough of, of mapping uh, object destructuring when you pass in an object as an argument and filtering in JavaScript. We're going to take a look at Axios to make some API calls for everyone's favorite API, the Pokemon API. And then we're going to dive into part two, where we're going to learn about React.js and, and Vite. And I thought a nice way to go into Axios might be, and to sort of review part one, Let's let's make a new NPM project and then write our, our code for it there. So I'm going to do a little bit of sort of like group coding um, where I'll be driving and kind of prompting folks, but I'd like you to help me along. So let me make a, a directory and I'll just call it Pokemon project. And let's let's work out of here. And I'll put a readme in there just so we have a, a nice frame of reference and we'll call it the Pokemon project. And let me go ahead and close all this other stuff out. So how do I create a new NPM project here? Cause we're gonna want to install, right? Some node modules. And uh, I apologize folks. I realize actually I didn't share. Is everyone seeing my screen right now? Okay, perfect. You didn't miss much. I just made a new directory, um, Pokemon project, and put a readme inside there. And that's where I am right now. So how do I create a new NPM project? Um, Mikhail, yes, sir. Uh, uh, NPM init dash Y. Yeah, I love it. NPM init. And we don't care about writing all the stuff. So let's do dash Y. Awesome. And now it's created a package.json for me. Um, I know that I want to use the newer, better way of like importing and exporting with JavaScript, uh, ES6 modules. I kind of remember I need to do something to package.json to make that happen. Could someone maybe tell me what that is? Uh, Momo, yes, sir. NPM install uh, Axis. Uh, we are going to need to do that as well, for sure. Um, that's going to install this program Axios that we're going to use, and it creates the node modules directory and does a lot of other good stuff. But let's say I want to, and let me actually. We'll come back to that one. Let's build this out a bit more and I'll I'll come back though. I, I did see a couple other hands up, um, though I missed who it was. So if, if you had your hand up, uh, feel free to jump in. Yeah, that was me. I was gonna say, I believe it was, uh, you set the type to module. Yeah, exactly. And we'll see in just a minute um, why we need to do this. But if I want to be able to say like import and import stuff the nice way, I have to add this to my package.json. Um, 
I don't have an index.js file that doesn't exist. So I do want to go ahead and create it. And can someone remind me, all right, if I want to be able to use an NPM script to run my index.js file, what do I need to add to package.json in order to do that? So instead of typing node index.js, which there's nothing in index.js right now, I want to be able to do like npm run, whatever, let's say start. What do I have to add to package.json? Uh, Daniel, yes, sir. Uh, I believe in the scripts, you put the name start. Yep. And then you put the, semi, uh, the colon and then you put the index.js. Very close. I need to give the full command that we would run on the command line. So if I just do index.js, and let's go ahead and let's put like a hello world and index.js so just so we can tell when this runs or not. I could do npm run start, but we're going to get uh, an error. That error is because I didn't have a comma. So fail to parse JSON data and the red squiggly here. That's how I knew the error here was a, a missing comma. Also, that is by far the most common error with JSON files because it's easy to forget. And we see this sh index.js command not found. SH is short for shell, as in the command line. And it's telling us, hey, I tried to run this command, this program. I tried to execute a command index.js, but that command doesn't exist. And, and that's because we need to use the, the program node that, that executes our JavaScript. But yeah, you pretty much hit the nail on the head, Daniel. And now if I do npm run start, that script works. And I can just type npm start because uh, npm has given us a, a sort of a nice little shortcut where we can just drop the run for start and test if we want to. Okay, awesome. I've got Axios installed. Um, I've got this installed. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and make a dot .git ignore. And can someone remind me why am I making a dot .git ignore file and what do we want to put in it? Uh, Momo, yes, sir. Yeah, to hide the 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 node modules. Okay, so when we make uh, add for files, it will not add it with the file. So we're saving memory, as I remember. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, sir. Um, you hit the nail on the head. And so now, node modules directory won't get checked into version control, and it won't take up space. And now we're we're doing pretty good. I've got my index.js. Uh, I know my npm start script works. It runs it. It says hello. Um, how can I import Axios? And this one we haven't covered as much because we only saw the, the this import statement a little. Uh, but does anyone want to take a crack at it? Now that I've installed Axios, how might I import it? Yeah, and we're still kind of seeing how to do this with JavaScript, so this is good to see. Um, so with the import statement, it's always going to be import and the name of the thing we want to import. Um, and in fact, what you will probably want to do is you will often want to just go to like the docs for the library in question because they'll tell you how to install it. Um, and then they should give an example of how to use it. So here's the common JS usage. Um, let's see if they have, I don't even know if they have the ES6 module usage or not. Um, in fact, they don't. And so this is why it's good to see both. Uh, there might be some reason they kind of want us to prefer the old way, but the new way should work just fine. 
So let's let's start with the new way also for demonstration purposes. Um, so we're importing from, and here I don't need to put say a relative path because since it's a node module we've installed with NPM, if I don't give a path, NPM will look in node modules for me. And it will, and and this you just sort of have to know, but that's where the docs are good and 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 why that's a good guess. Uh honestly, chat GPT is also good as well, like import Axios with ES6 module. I normally Google this stuff, but ChatGPT does do quite it is quite good at this. Um, so sometimes you'll have to check this out because sometimes we'll see it later, but there might be like multiple things to import. And it looks a bit like this. But that that we'll kind of look at that a bit more later. So we've imported Axios. Um, Axios is a lot like fetch. So we can use it to make an HTTP request to the Pokemon API. And in fact, let me head over there right now. And I'm kind of copying this from my notes. And just to double check, Everyone here, you all got some hands on time with the Pokemon API last week, correct? Yeah. So we're all familiar. And and you all spent some time with fetch, right? To get stuff from the Pokemon API. And maybe talked a little bit about like promises. Async a wait. Did we talk a little bit about async a wait? Can I get like a thumbs up, thumbs down? Yeah. So Axios basically does the same thing as Fetch. Um, it offers some functionality for us that Fetch doesn't have. Axios uses promises by default. It gives us something called interceptors that are a little more powerful for working with requests and responses. It has better compatibility. If we were gonna write some JavaScript on the back end, and it has better air handling. So moving forward, you should probably always use Axios instead of Fetch, though you'll need to, unlike Fetch, you'll need to install it. And the good news is you can use it very similarly to, to Fetch. Um, and let me go ahead. I'm just gonna make a, a placeholder for this URL, um, mainly just so I don't forget it. We'll we'll bring it back later. And I think I'll put my hello world up here just, just so it's there. And just like with fetch, we're gonna make an HTTP get request to this URL. Um, it's gotta be an async function because it's using a promise under the hood. So JavaScript has to know like, hey, it's gonna take a while for this to come back. Wait till we get a response back before we try to do more stuff. And it would help if I got my syntax right because it's an arrow function and then we are defining an async. We are defining an async arrow function and setting it to that, that variable. I'm gonna put everything in uh, a try catch block so that if there is an error with the request that we can deal with it later. I'm just gonna put the, the URL there just just so I have it, just to make it a little easier to read. And let's actually use Axios now. And it's pretty straightforward. This should look pretty similar to fetch. And I'm just gonna pass in the URL. We want to make that HTTP get request to. And let's print out the response. And we'll play with this response in a bit more. Um, Actually, let's just maybe print out a bit more of what we want. 
response.data and, and let's see what's in there and we can go from there. And if there's an error, let's just print it out here as well. And I think I'll just add another console log here just so I, I can see what's going on. And we'll just like making get request to URL. And let's go ahead and, and run this and, and see what happens. So I got back undefined and, and that tells me I'm probably doing something silly here that that's easy to fix. Um, so I think my first rule of debugging is, is simplify. I try to simplify stuff or comment stuff out until I start getting some data back. And so this is good. I'm seeing, oh, I'm getting back promise pending. So that tells me, indeed, we got some sort of response, but I'm actually not handling it right here. Mikhail, yes, sir. Is it the await in front of ad sales? Yeah, that would totally be it. Thank you so much, man, because I think I was going to take a couple steps to get there. Um, and this is actually really good for us to see, but I, I did not do this on purpose, so I really appreciate it. Uh, that is totally what's going on because async and await are what tell JavaScript that we're dealing with promises. And so the fact that I'm getting this response is promise pending tells me that that JavaScript was not handling the promise correctly here. Like when the response came back, it wasn't actually taking that promise from a pending state to a completed state. And let's see what we get now. Nice. Thank you, man. And so now we get back a ton of data in the response object. And we can see there's a whole bunch of stuff here. Um, the response object is huge. But what we actually want is this property response.data. And then inside here, we see even there's a ton of stuff. Right. Um, and if say we wanted to show each Pokemon's image, we would need one of these sprite URLs. Right. And that's the back of my Pokemon. So let's, let's grab the front default image for the Pokemon. Let's, let's grab the front sprite default. So it should be response.data dot sprites. And sometimes what I'll do when I'm, if I have a ton of this, I would just copy and paste this whole thing into like a file somewhere. So it's easier for me to read, like just a scratch file or a text file or something like that. And now let's run this and see if we get what we want. And indeed we do. Brandon, yes, sir. Um, wouldn't so I, I know you mentioned uh, copy pasting to try to like sort through the data, but isn't the point of doing like RESTful API and having proper documentation supposed to prevent you from having to go through that? Like wouldn't most documentation tell you like, hey, if, like if you want this, here's a list of things, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's a great question. And ideally, yes. Um, the Pokemon API, I think its data is pretty good. The reality is there's a lot of APIs out there that have bad documentation. And, and that's why you might have to do that sometimes. Um, also, again, the Pokemon API is e extremely good and I think it is up to date. Um, even this, to be honest, if I'm if I'm reading this, sometimes just to keep track, 
And also because Axios adds a little bit of wrapper, uh, I think like response.data might have been added by Axios, though I'm not certain about that. Um, like if we grab that URL and paste it in here. Yeah, like if we look at this, that data property was added by Axios for the response data. And then I think it maybe added some other metadata. Um, but mainly the reason is a lot of APIs have terrible documentation or sometimes it's wrong. Okay. And honestly, and then, sometimes it's just easier for me to read. Um, um, Cody, yes, sir. Okay. Hey, Brandon, was that a follow on to your question? I don't want to change the subject. Yeah, it was. I, I had a, another question. Oh, yeah. Go for it. Sorry. Um, and then is there uh, an extension of some sort that you know of or could recommend that would maybe give us the um, dot notation for these responses? Like, is there a way to um, integrate Emmet somehow into this? Uh, probably. To, to be honest, I, if the API documentation is good, that can be a great tool. Um, I honestly find it easiest to just copy and paste it into a file. And then if I save it as a JSON file in VS Code, VS Code will sort of like apply all of the formatting rules and stuff and let me like collapse, you know, and stuff like that. Okay. Um, and that's kind of how I like to do it, but there probably are other extensions to help with that as well. Okay, thank you. For sure. Um, Cody, yes, sir. Yeah, actually it wasn't changing the subject. So is this uh, like postman.com, I remember, you guys talking about that? Is that something that could help in this situation? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of tools out there. Um, we're gonna see. Did you guys see Thunder Client yet? We did. Yeah. Yeah. Postman, Thunder Client, basically the same thing, right? What they all do is they send an HTTP request, and and they give us a nice little graphic user interface to do it. And you get the response back here. Um, so again, I think just the thing to note is here we're using Axios and let's just print So they're all called HTTP clients, right? Thunder client is an HTTP client. Postman is an HTTP client. There's something really nice, uh, I think called requests for VS Code as well. There's also something on the command line, uh, curl or wget, that make HTTP requests. And that's the beauty of HTTP and the protocol is the server doesn't care about what's sending the request. It just sends it back in the desired response. Um, again, I just like to look at the actual data my program is getting because Axios does add, I think, a little bit of extra stuff. But all these tools are are really useful as, as well. Um, let's, see, let's see. We need to scroll all the way up here because there's a ton. The response object has a ton of stuff on it that we don't really need, but actually becomes quite useful that Axios adds. Like here's the HTTP response status, uh, the HTTP response text. And you actually see all this in Thunder Client. It's just shown visually. If I uh, go to, I'm getting a little off track here, so I'll come back on in a bit. It's, it's somewhere, here are the response headers. Right, and and so Axios is just putting all this information on a JavaScript object for us, and it just has a ton of of information there. But it's response.data that has what we care about with with Axios. Uh, Brandon, yes, sir. And then and then I do want to uh, move on. Oh, did you have a question, Brandon, or was was your hand up from before? Perfect. Um, yeah, so long story short, 
with Axios, response.data has what we care about. Because the response object in Axios has a bunch of other stuff. So now we've kind of taken this journey full circle. Um, let's see about Vt and um, React.js. And so I just want to pause and check in and see if folks have any questions. Otherwise, I think let's take a short five minute break. Uh, just I like to take the break before we switch topics. I think that kind of lets our brains catch up a bit. And then we'll kind of see how these pieces start to combine for building a front end. Um, any questions on folks' minds or, or things maybe that we want to review with Axios or how to get data from Axios before we uh, before we break? Okay, awesome. Thank you very much, everyone. Let's take a five minute break and I'll see you all in five minutes. And we're gonna look at React and Vite, which is gonna be awesome. All right, so we've been covering a lot of ground. Uh, we just kind of talked through Axios, which bears a lot of familiarities to fa fetch. Um, I mean, in fact, I didn't, use it here, but you could see how once we use Axios to get data, we could then use dot map and dot filter to manipulate it. If instead of a single Pokemon, we were getting, say, a whole bunch of Pokemon and we wanted to get their uh, main default image URL. Uh, all of this has kind of been not, not a prelude or a warm up entirely, but building into Vite and React. And, and this is how we're going to learn to build the user interfaces that are going to run in the browser. And you already got a, a taste of this last week, but we're going to dig into it more. Um, so Vite is not a front-end framework. It's what's called a build tool. It's going to help make our lives easier. Because as you all have seen with, with NPM and Node.js and package.json, and just even installing Axios, there's a lot of dependencies. And, and that's just going to happen more and more the more JavaScript stuff we do. The JavaScript ecosystem is very tool heavy. So this is gonna help us a lot. We're gonna to learn to use uh, React.js, which is what's called a user interface framework or a UI framework. It was created by Facebook. Um, sort of like you see here, it has this concept of something it calls a component where you write a function that looks an awful lot like JavaScript. Note the object destructuring here. But then we see some stuff that kind of looks like HTML. And we're gonna talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, but this gives you what's called a component that I can then go ahead and reuse all over my application. Um, and this is a big part of why people love React. And in fact, over here, you can see it in action. That video component that we created is being used here. And again, it's this sort of interesting combination of um, a syntax that looks an awful lot like HTML and JavaScript. We can see here this videos.map. There's some stuff in curly brackets, which we'll talk about in just a minute. But fundamentally here, we have a function that takes in an argument and we can see here that we're destructuring an object and it returns stuff. And the stuff it returns is what gets rendered on the screen in the browser, right? That's the user interface, but we can also write JavaScript. Um, we're gonna focus on React in this course, some alternatives to React, some other front end UI frameworks are AngularJS, which is created by Google. Um, same concept, some differences, and something called Vue.js that uh, apparently they have their sponsors all over their website. But they all kind of share the same DNA in, in, in a whole lot of ways. So that's just to kind of give a little context on what we're doing here. Um, let's go ahead and, and see what this looks like in action. And what I'm gonna to need to do is I'm gonna create a new project um, because we're gonna want a, a new project for this as, as we build this out.
and let me just quickly take a look at my notes to make sure I name this uh, what I want it to be. And let's, I'm gonna name this project number guessing. Um, so there's two ways to create a project in Vite and Vite should have been installed, I believe with uh, NPM. And actually, let me double check this because I've installed Vite so long ago. I'm not even sure I remember. So let me just double double check actually how to install this. Um, here we go. This is way more than we need, but let's just find the one command that I want just to double check. I'm pretty darn sure it's just like npm install v. Let me actually ask ChatGPT. Oh, Francisco. Yes. I don't think you have to actually install it manually. You should be able to just utilize the npm create command and call v as the argument. Oh, man. Thank you so much. I think you're right. That was throwing me a bit. So I saw that I was like, oh, this, we must have to install this globally or something. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, man. And, and I apologize, folks. So indeed, like you're saying, we can probably just do NPM and use the create command, which then it hooks into some stuff that got installed with NPM and do NPM create Vite. And if I want to create a new project, inside a directory, I'm going to give it the name of that directory. So this is going to create a new project directory for me. And V gives me this prompt and we want to choose React because we're using React JS. That's going to be the framework that we're using. Um, we are not using TypeScript. So we're just going to choose plain old JavaScript and I am actually not certain what SWC stands for off the top of my head, but I think we should be okay with plain old JavaScript. And so now it's created a directory for us and there are some commands that we can run. Um, just to demonstrate another way to, to use V, let me go ahead and delete this. Um, one moment, Rich. If I have a project directory already and I want to create a Vite project inside here, I can just run npm create Vite space and hit dot. That will create a new Vite project inside this directory. Um, and Rich, yes, sir, what's up? So SWC is basically a drop-in replacement for Babel. It uses Rust instead, but Babel is still more widely used. Yeah, got it, thank you. Okay, that is good to know. Um, definitely out of scope for today, but that that is very good to know. If anyone is curious, Google Babel JavaScript later if, if you wanna start going down the rabbit hole of, of front-end build tools. So I've created a, a V project. It's telling me to run NPM install. And indeed, if I look inside my number guessing project, I see that V has created a package JSON for me. And let me close these others out just so there's no confusion. It's given it a name. It's already set up ES6 modules for me. It's given me some scripts that we'll talk about in a minute, dev, build, lint, preview. I see there are dependencies, React, and, and a bunch of dependencies. There's no node modules directory and there's no package lock JSON. So that's why I can tell that these NPM dependencies haven't been installed. So let me go ahead and run NPM install.
All right. And now I can see that indeed a package lock JSON has been created, node modules with a whole bunch of things that React depends on and React has, has been installed. And let me go ahead real quick and do a little browser setup here. Because we are going to want to be looking at both the browser and our server in just a moment, or our code rather. So Vite's done a bunch of stuff for us here, and let's walk through this a bit before we run the code and kind of see what it has created in, in action. So in this numbers guessing project, I can see a package.json, a package lock.json. It's created a readme file that tells us a bit about it. It's given us a template that's a minimal setup to get React working in Vite. Um, some stuff about plugins that we don't have to worry about. It's created that git ignore file for us that has a whole bunch of other stuff in addition to node modules, like a log file, some things we'll we'll talk about later. Um, if we use a tool like ESLint or Prettier to help with our formatting, there's a, a configuration file here for that. There's an index.html file. This is actually really interesting and important because actually when we're developing, this is the HTML file we're gonna want our, our server to host that we're gonna want to load in the browser. And if I look through here, I see the normal things I expect to see for an HTML file, a language, a char set. There's some sort of icon, the V icon. There's a meta tag that sets some viewport information so that our the, the width of the browser is configured correctly to the device, a title. And the interesting stuff is really right here. I see a div with an ID of root, and we'll talk in a bit about what that means. And I see some JavaScript loaded in a script tag, node type module, right? Then we'll see how ES6 modules are being used, but note where this JavaScript is coming from, this source directory, main.jsx. Um, so let's take a look at main.jsx and let's see what's in there. And if I go here to main.jsx, I see a whole lot of interesting stuff. We've, we've learned about import statements and we see that in action here. We see we're importing the React node module, another node module named React DOM that lets us interact with the browser's DOM with React, so both of these. We see here, and I can tell because of this relative path, uh, a file named app that's coming from our source code. It's got an interesting file extension, .jsx, um, and I'll talk about that in just a moment. And then we're importing a CSS file that I also see here. So these are relative paths to where this main.jsx file lives. And then I see all sorts of kind of crazy looking stuff here, React DOM, create root, document, get element by ID. And that's kind of interesting because we just saw that index.html that had an element root. And then this method render. And then some stuff here that sort of looks like HTML, but but is not. Um, and we'll talk through, I think, what that is in, in just a moment. Um, and I think I'll run the dev server so we can see it too. Just to kind of finish our tour, before we kind of dive into what this stuff means. If I look around in this source file, I see this app.jsx file, which is a React component named app. And we'll kind of talk in a minute about what's going on here. I see a lot of imports from an assets directory with image assets, some CSS, and importing something from React itself. And we see these curly brackets here because this React package has many different objects or functions that we could be possibly importing. 
right? So when I have to give a specific name because there's many possible things to import, this is the syntax that you'll see is these curly brackets. Inside this assets directory, I see some CSS and an image file. There's a public directory over here that also has an image asset. And finally, uh, outside the source, the SRC directory is a, a file named v.config that has some JavaScript that sets up configuration stuff for V and for React.js that we're not gonna touch that much. But again, we can note uh, some imports. Note there's an export statement. We haven't talked a lot about imports and exports with, with ES6 modules, but we can see an example here of how if I wanna have something ready to export from my JavaScript code, here's a way to do it. And this isn't worth going into too much, but this is a configuration object that helps V do what it does. The, the most important bits here are the scripts in package.json and the source file. So let me go ahead. And if we look at these scripts, I see build, I see lint, I see preview. Dev is the most important one. So let, let's, let me run build and then we'll run dev and, and talk about it. So if I run the build script, something interesting happens. A new directory is created. It's named dist, which is short for distribution. And if I go in here, I see index.html. I see known modules. I see a ton of stuff. And in fact, if I wanted to use VS Code Live Share, Oh, I'm so sorry. That is not the one that I wanted to use. And I'm honestly not quite sure how to. There we go. Let's let's stop the live share session. Not the live share, but uh, the live server, excuse me, which I think is this one over here, the other live. Yeah, let's see. Refuse to apply styles. Okay, so we ran into some sort of issue. Um, it's not worth going into now, and we're not going to be using NPM build much, but I just want to point out it's created an index.html file and it's stuck all the JavaScript that we have and condensed it. And we'll learn about this much later. Um, but as you may have noted, this JavaScript does not look like normal JavaScript with these HTML looking stuff in it. It's called uh, JSX uh, syntax. And so some extra processing needs to happen to it. And there are two ways to do that. One is npm run build. The other one that we're going to be using 99% of the time is npm run dev. And what that is going to do is, and in fact, we don't need this dist directory at all for this. And I'm just going to go ahead and delete it. Is npm run dev runs what's called a development server. So it's running a little web server on port 5173. And guess what it's running for us is all this stuff over here. I'm going to make this font size just a tiny bit less so we can see it better. And if I go into index.html and I change something, like let's say I change the title up here where it says V plus React, let me add some exclamation points. And when I save index.html, the server reloads. So the dev server does what's called hot module reloading, where it's watching all of these files. And when I change one, it reloads and I get to see my change right away. Oh, and I'm so sorry about that, folks. Um, give me just one sec to bring everything back to the way it's supposed to be. There we go. And not only does this work for index.html, but any of these other files as well. Now here in main.jsx, there's actually 
nothing I see that if I change it would be changed here. But if I go to app.jsx, I do see a lot of stuff. I see v.react, right? So maybe I want to change that. And I immediately see that show up. And we have these CSS files, app.css, all of these different paddings, all of these different classes. And if I change this CSS, it would show up here as, as well. Um, so let's talk through each of these files and, and what they're doing. Oh, and I heard a, a ding, but I think it was someone exiting or re-entering the Zoom room. So let's start with the CSS. There's two CSS files, index.css and app.css. Index.css takes precedence, but you want to put all of your CSS here in app.css for simplicity's sake, um, I think is, is probably the way to, to do it. Later on, when we see Bootstrap, we'll maybe put one or two global things in here. Um, and in fact, all of this sort of template code that Beat adds, we can just get rid of because we don't really want to use it. And so, in fact, every time you kind of start up a new project, you'll just want to delete this stuff um, just for fun here in app.css, we can add like maybe, uh, for an H1 element, let's make the color blue. And we can see that that changes, but let's get rid of these other things that, that we don't want so that we can talk about it more. Um, we're going to learn about how I can click on this button and the count updates with this thing called React Component State tomorrow. We're not going to worry about it today. So I don't need to import that. I don't want to show either of these logos. So I'm going to get rid of those two. Um, before I do, let's look at this and, and talk about what we're seeing here. Um, actually, let me just get rid of this, because then I think it will just be easier for us to talk about. So let's get rid of that and let's get rid of that and let's get rid of that and let's get rid of that. And now we can get rid of these, right? And this is basically what you want to do every time you start a new project from scratch is just delete the V template and you can delete all this other stuff as well. So whenever you're developing, you're always going to want to have the browser open. And in the browser, you're always going to want to have the JS console open. Um, and then just one minute. Because this is where useful error messages will show up. I'll get an error message here that I actually see in the browser sometimes. But not always. Sometimes I might only see the error message in the JavaScript console. And note here this hello world message. And over here, it tells me where in my code it's coming from, from app.jsx line four. So what we're seeing here is a React component. A React component is a function. You can pass it arguments. This one, we're not passing any arguments to, and we'll learn more about that tomorrow. There's two parts to the function. Um, just like any function, we can write whatever JavaScript we want here. Note that this JavaScript is actually getting run inside my browser, right? That's why I see the hello world here in the JavaScript console. This JavaScript is not getting run from the command line. The V dev server is running a little web server that hosts that index.html page. And if we open up the network tab, we can kind of see this in action. And let me clear this and run it again. So the network tab shows me all the HTTP requests and responses my browser gets. 
So the dev servers for development, but in the real world, right, there would be some server somewhere on the cloud hosting this that my browser would talk to. And it sends the request for index.html, which is, um, I'm going to be honest, I'm not sure why it isn't showing up here. Oh, it's because I have another filter on. There's a lot of things you can do with the network tab. But if I scroll all the way up here, the very first thing my browser does is send a request to the server running on this port. And the server sends back index.html. And we'll talk more in a moment about div ID root and the script tag being super important. Uh, just to kind of wrap up talking about what we're seeing here and, and, and Len, then I'll get to your question. So a React component is a normal JavaScript function and we can write whatever JS that we want here, you know, const x equals five plus three, console.log x. Inside this return statement is where stuff gets a little different. And this is where the syntax called JSX. And I actually have to look up what that acronym stands for, but it basically lets us write HTML inside our JavaScript code and Vite and some other tools do the work of actually turning it into JavaScript and, excuse me, JavaScript and HTML that's sent to the browser for the browser to read. Because this is, the browser can't actually interpret this. V has to do some work for us, which is why we have to run NPM run dev. Um, and so I could add an H2 right here. This is an H2 in my JSX. And so with the React component, it returns stuff to be rendered. And if I want to stick some JavaScript inside there, I do it in a curly bracket. And I can even do JavaScript code inside my curly bracket. Right, so JSX is a template language that we use that's JavaScript plus HTML and this syntax so that we can combine it all together to put stuff in the user's browser. Uh, Len, yes, sir. Um, it's something you said at the very beginning and, and I'm just kind of glad you ignored my question because you talk about a, a, a deleting all the V like kind of code in the beginning. Is there yeah. a way to like if you if Vita is your jam and reacts your jam to set up a like your like delete it net normally and just resave it over? Or is it something that is too complicated to even try and discover on my own? Uh there's probably a setting somewhere. I, I apologize. I don't know it off the top of my head. It's not you. worth saving on your own. That fair it, enough. That, no, no. Yeah. Good enough. Done. Totally. Thank you. Yeah. For sure. It's it's not as bad as it sounds. Just to reiterate, you know, folks, what you want to do, because most of the time we'll actually have a project for you to, to pull down and clone. But if you're creating a React project from scratch in V, just basically delete everything inside app JSX, but leave the, an empty component, delete everything in index HTML, delete everything in app CSS, and then you're good to go. Um, on that note, there are some things you should not touch. Don't touch main.jsx. Do not touch vconfig.js. Um, and those are the main ones. Um, let me pause and check in and see if folks have questions, because I, I do want to talk a bit more about kind of how these different files interact. But I know I just did a lot of talking. And, and threw a lot of stuff out there with React and components and stuff. So I just want to check in and, and see what's on people's minds. Momo, yes, sir. Uh, what the difference there between the index CSS and app CSS? Maybe you mentioned it, but maybe I didn't catch it. Yeah, great question. Um, 
use app CSS instead of index CSS. Index CSS actually will override app CSS, but we only want to put like a few global things inside index CSS. Um, and in fact, if we kind of go to index.html, we can we can kind of see, in fact, we can kind of see it right here. Well, I'll talk through it when I talk through main and, and app JSX, actually, because we'll we'll see it then. Yeah, good question. Um, what else is on people's minds? Uh, Momo, yes, sir. What did you mean, sir, by when you want to add something global, you will add it to the, I, I got the idea, but uh, I will use now the app, CS, uh, the app CSS. And he said, if you want to add something global, oh. you will add it to the, the, the other one. The... Yeah, totally. I will cover that uh, in just a minute when I walk through the whole project. And in fact, as, as I'm not seeing any other questions, let's go ahead and do that now. Let's take a couple minutes, talk about how these different files interact, and then we can write a little code to sort of get warmed up for our assignments. Um, so again, the thing here to remember is this JavaScript code is not running from your command line. It's running inside the browser. And right now, my laptop has both my client and server but eventually when say we put our project on the cloud, you know, all of my JavaScript React JS code will live on some server in the cloud. And then anyone's browser over the internet will be able to grab that JavaScript and run it. So this is a like a little distributed system with the client server architecture, even though for development purposes, we have the client and the server running on the same machine. And this is where I think the network tab helps a lot to understand what exactly the browser does, which is really important to start understanding now how this works. So we have this little VDev server running, right? If I killed it and I tried to load the page, I'd get an error because my server isn't running. And so when the browser sends this request to my, my own machine on port 5173, uh, nothing is is listening for it or sending anything back. When it is running, there's all this stuff that happens that uh, is a bit of sort of the dev server magic. But the most important part is this first part where the HTML file is sent to the browser. Right? And we see all this stuff. And so what happens, and in fact, Vite has added some extra stuff but remember what a browser does is it goes line by line through the HTML file and executes every line. So when it gets say here to line 20, it grabs this JavaScript and executes it. Uh, Brandon, yes, sir. Um, so is the, is this stack doing everything for the most part that we've learned up to this point? No, because we where we're going to end up is just like you all did some stuff with Flask and Postgres. Um, this JavaScript stuff is only running in the browser, right? And let me bust open a little TL draw here. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, server, let's just say Flask. Later it'll be Django, but since that's kind of what you all saw last week, client um, and the client, let's make the client a little bigger. And so the client is a browser, right? And inside the browser, our JavaScript code is is running, and we're using the React JS framework. And what's going to end up happening 
is, and the key thing here to keep in mind is, uh, where's a cloud? And the key thing to keep in mind here is these things are going to be communicating over the internet, right? For us, they're both running on the same machine, but so we're not there yet, but to use the example from earlier, that list of tasks, like that information is going to live on the server in a database and Flask is going to send that information to React.js to the client, to the browser, where then I can look at my tasks, or if I want to modify a task, let's say check it complete, well, that data has to get sent back to the server in the cloud, because otherwise, you know, when I close my browser, then that's gone forever. And what if I want to log into it from my phone or another computer? Um, does that help answer your question? Yes, thanks. Totally. Yeah, great question. Uh, Cody, yes, sir. Hey, thanks. Real quick, what was the command that you that you put in to run Vite? I missed it twice, I think. NPM run dev to run the server. NPM. Perfect. Thank you. Yep. And just to reiterate, you can see those script commands here in scripts in the package.json. No, perfect. Thanks. For sure. Yeah. Great, great questions, guys. Um, yeah, because this is a bit of a new world because stuff is getting more complex now, right? This week, we are focusing just on the front end, on this part here. Uh, you guys kind of saw a bit of a preview of, of the full stack stuff, but this week we are focusing more on the, the front end piece um, in terms of learning and what we'll be building and doing stuff with. So I know that my browser loads this index.html page, and I know it does it by going through it line by line. And when it gets here, it loads this V SVG icon, which I think is actually used up here in the in the icon for the thing. Yep, I note that that's gone, and it's get back. And the browser just goes through here line by line. And then when it gets to the body, it creates a div. And in fact, if I use the browser and and the elements tab, we can go here, and we can look at this div. It's got the ID of root. And something really interesting happens if I look what's inside here. Where did all this stuff come from? It came from app.jsx, this h1, this h2. Like, let's go ahead and get rid of this. Right? So what's happening is this JavaScript code is running in my browser, but it's creating these HTML elements that are all being created inside this div with the ID root. And when you see root, think root of a tree, right? Of, of a tree data structure. And the DOM is a, is a tree. So how does this happen? Well, it happens in two parts. One part is we obviously have to create the div in index.html. And then in this JavaScript code, in the main.jsx, it's called mounting the application, where we have to tell React when this code runs, hey, find this div. Everything you create is going to go inside there. And if we look again at main.jsx, we see React DOM the library for React interacting with the DOM, create root, create the root of our tree, of our component tree, or our elements tree, document, get element by ID, root, render. And render is the term for when we actually like execute one of these React component functions to return stuff that we want to show the user. And strict mode is stuff that's there to help with development, it can also cause some headaches. So we don't actually need it. And what am I rendering? 
well, this looks like an HTML element, right? But it's got a different name, it's custom. I'm importing it from app.jsx. I'm rendering this React component. So if I went ahead and changed this to something, a different name, we get an error, right? Target container is not a DOM element, blah, 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 blah. It can't find it. So the job of main.jsx is to mount the whole React application. That's its really only job. Um, and we do import index.css here. And Momo, you had a really good question about what, what goes in index.css for somewhere else. As we get into like things like Bootstrap or, or CSS frameworks, sometimes we'll want to put that CSS, that sort of like skeleton for more CSS inside index CSS, but not very often. Um, because the same way that really the main job of main.jsx is to set everything up to actually run our program, it's the same with index.css. And most of what we actually want for our program belongs in app.jsx. And here we see we import app.css. And we'll see about how to create multiple components later. But what you'll see is everything we create lives inside app.jss, the JSX, the app.jss component. Brandon, yes, sir. Is this called a, a HTML injection? Uh, like maybe. The JavaScript is certainly creating the HTML for us. That is 100% what, what's happening, yes. Um, Momo, yes, sir. Uh, I just wanna to, I feel like I didn't understand it. So when we start, we start with the index dot HTML, we build the front end from there or from the app dot G J S X. You're going to build the front end from app dot J S X. From app dot J S X. Correct. The H, the the so the the JavaScript and the HTML from app.jsx. Correct. You got it. Okay. Uh, so what or when we will use the index.html? Never. 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 Correct. Okay. And 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 you said the main dot JSX that will be like where everything. Uh, will be controlled from there or because I didn't understand this point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me walk through that again. And I see one other question. And then I think I, I do want to switch gears because I want to make sure to write a little code in here before we hit noon to kind of set everyone up for, for this afternoon. Um, and Eric, what's your question as well? Uh, I was just going to ask, um, like how multiple pages is handled. Is that all rendered via main JSX and you're just importing different components still? Um, we will we will get to that in the next couple of days. It is all handled within app.jsx and we import all the components into there. Okay, thanks. Totally, yeah. And so just to reiterate, and, and this is good to walk through because this does get more complex. The browser loads index.html. We need this file, but V has set it up for us. So we're never going to have to modify it, almost never. And there's a div here that's created with an ID. And we load the JavaScript in main.jsx. V has already created main.jsx for us. And we do need this, but we almost never need to modify it because it's already been set up. And what main JX does is, and um, we can add 
main JSX mounting app. If I go ahead and I clear this, I refresh my code, right? Main.jsx is getting run in the browser. And what it does is through a little bit of magic, it finds that DOM element with the ID root that we care about. And it connects our React app to it. And it tells React, hey, all of the components you create, when you are like creating HTML elements, because our JavaScript code is now creating these HTML elements, do it as children of this element right here. And then, and that's all that main.jsx should do. And so we don't need to, to modify it. And then all of the code for our React app that we want to run, we can actually put inside here in app.jsx. And it gets created here inside the root element. Um, Brandon, yes, sir. And then I do want to move on a bit. Uh, what's up? Just a uh, one, like a quick one sentence. Index.html is a template, and through Vite, uh, you you return your modules and then push them into index.html or based on whatever you're trying to do. Uh, kind of, sort of. I mean, okay, index.html. Yeah. We could just move on. That. It's all good. Yeah, we'll, we'll move on. The way to think about it is index.html, it's a normal HTML page, but the only thing it does is load this JavaScript that then does all this fancy stuff. Like that's its only job. So this is what's called like a single page app where we have a ton of JavaScript running in the browser that actually does all the work. Um, a template is a bit of, of, of something else. Um, yeah, index.html and main.jsx sort of bootstrap the rest of the, the application. But I'd be happy to go through and discuss that a bit more later as, as well. Um, I think I, I do want to write a little code here so we can kind of see it in action and to kind of set you guys up for this afternoon. So I apologize, we might run a couple minutes over noon, but it shouldn't be that much longer. So one thing I want to point out quickly Oh, I'm so sorry about that, folks. If I have all right, all right, we won't worry about doing that. If I have a React component, um all of this has to be wrapped in a single element or component. And this error here says adjacent JSX elements, think like HTML elements, must be wrapped in an enclosing tag. So I could put them inside a div and it works just fine. And that's just kind of how React is designed and how it works. But it does add this extra div here now that I don't really need. So React does something called a fragment. And each of these is actually React views it as a JSX element, and it's actually the React JS framework that turns this into HTML without going into it too much. So React has something that they call a fragment, and that's what this is, that does the same job, but without adding the extra div, just so that you're aware of what this is and if you see that error. So the goal for today is just to get familiar with this and, and use what you've already learned. Um, so let me go ahead and, and in fact, let's just, uh, I'll leave the, that H1, but let me go ahead and get rid of, of everything else here. And I'm just gonna build out a, a number guessing game, um, kind of like what you all were doing last week. So we can kind of see this in action. And this is really the goal for today. We're not going to get super deep into React. There's, I think, enough that we've thrown at you with the frameworks and all of the tooling. So
we just want you to get comfortable with Vite and creating a React project and inside AppJSX using this curly bracket syntax so that, and this is really sort of the templating part so that you can put JavaScript inside this JSX syntax, right? So I can have a game name. And if I want to say, have some interactivity, I can make a form and let's maybe make a form element. And, and inside here, we can put some, some inputs And we're just going to make sort of a random number guessing game. Um, and I'm going to kind of talk through it. And, and please feel free to, to ask questions as, as we go, because I think this is this is good to see. So again, we're not hooking into React entirely yet. We're using the tools we're already familiar with, but um, doing it in a new context. right? And we probably want a button. And in fact, I could probably make this not an input, but a button. And the one thing I will mention that is good to know um, is if I did want to add some CSS, let's say I wanted to make a class and let's just call it like submit button. And maybe I wanted the background color to be, I don't know, red. I do The syntax is a little different. It looks a lot like HTML, but we have to use class name instead of class. Uh, and that's the one, that's one significant difference of this JSX syntax versus normal HTML. And so I've got a form, I've got an input. Um, you know, if I want to do something with this, like, let's say, the user is going to click on it and I want something to happen with that guess. Can someone maybe remind me, like, how do I hook up this function so that when the button is clicked, I, I see this message printed to the, the console in my browser? Well, I just added to the form on submit. And I'm going to use an arrow function because I do need to pass the event, the DOM event that's created into my method. And now if I do this, I see guess, but why this is changing up here, this stuff is running again, the whole page is refreshing. Uh, can someone remind me why and, and what I can do to make that stop? Mikhail, yes, sir. So do you have to do the e.prevent default? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. With an HTML form, the default behavior is what it's actually doing is it's trying to send a post request to the server if we go to, it, it's a little hard to see. Um, but somewhere, somewhere, yeah, it's a little hard to see, but the default behavior is the browser tries to send a post request to the server uh, and then it refreshes the page, but that's not actually what we wanted to do. So we want to prevent that default behavior. Right, and this is good because I don't need the page to refresh and that, that's a bad user experience. Um, so now I've kind of got my button hooked up. 
Um, can someone remind me, like, we're, we're not using React to do this yet. What's the, what's the sort of old school way to grab the value that I type in here? Uh, Eric, yes, sir. Uh, you would grab the input dot value from that input field. Uh, yes, we totally could. How do I grab the input field? Uh, normally you'd use document dot. You could use query selector and ID um, and grab the field by, yeah, the name there. Uh, and then do dot value. Yeah, totally. Um, and I think I'll just grab the input here and then we can grab the value um, on the next line. But for today, for the assignment that we're gonna give you all, uh, we, we do want you to do it the old way just to kind of get used to React. Uh, so, so you should still do it this way. And then um, I'm also going to go ahead and then let's let's in fact just console.log user input dot value. Make sure I didn't do anything silly. I see nine. I see seven. We're doing great. Um, I'm going to add some room here for uh, to show like the results of our guess outside the form as well. And the, the guessing game is going to be pretty, pretty simple. We're going to create a random number. And if the guess is too high, then we, we say too high. If it's too low, we say too low. So right here, let's make our random number. And I am totally following my guide code here as I, you know, I don't remember stuff like this off the top of my head, but this should give us a random number between one and 100 because math.random, I believe, gives us like a, a decimal value between zero and one, like 0.73, say. And let's just say like, hey, if the user input value is greater than the random number, we're going to say too high. And let's actually grab that bit of the DOM that we want to manipulate. And then inside here, we can just modify it and we can say result.inner HTML equals too high. And here, let's do an else if, if it's too low. And if it's not too high and it's not too low, the guess must be correct. And it would help if I added uh, the else statement at the end to make sure that we don't always do that, which would be bad. And then we can say, You want. So and let's let's in fact print the random number so we can test our game and make sure everything's working. So the random number is forty. Five is too low, 43 is too high. 
But with 40, I win. And if I refresh the page, I can play again, right? And if I didn't stop that prevent default, every time I make a guess, the page gets refreshed and a new random number is created, which is not what we want at all. And as we get deeper into React, we'll see that that's really what happens. Like we're kind of capturing the browser and Frankensteining it a bit. Um, because we have our React.js, our JavaScript code doing all of the work now. So we want to control when the browser does stuff because we're controlling when the HTML elements are put on the screen. So that's really everything. Um, I know we covered a lot of ground and, and I, I ran a bit long. So um, thank you all very much. Um, let me quickly walk through the assignments for today and the afternoon schedule. Um, there is no guest speaker this afternoon. Um, I think that was a scheduling goof on our end. I believe our, that guest speaker is coming on Thursday on the 27th. Uh, for today, and there's code for everything that we've written in here in, in these directories. There is a reading assignment. Uh, please do check this out. I think it's very useful. I'll also share another link that I think is good to, uh, if anyone wants to look ahead of it, that is good. But we're gonna ask you to use V and React to build a, a, a Pokemon app where you have like your team of Pokemon and you use the Pokemon API. Um, but we, we just want you to create a single button that you can click to display user images and, and make a layout and use Axios. Um, and, and we want you to do it using the tools that you learned last week, these DOM manipulation tools. Because again, we just want to get you comfortable with the project structure. Um, if you get it done with this and you want to look ahead at the React stuff, you can, but that's not the, the intent of, of the exercise, right? And I think there's a good amount here with filtering and displaying and, and stuff like that. Um, so please do build this out with, with the DOM with using JavaScript to interact with the DOM, just like we saw here where we're doing that inside a React component. So all of your work should be inside app.jsx and any CSS you want to add should be inside app.css. And then the other assignment is very similar and it's going to be a to-do list. Um, and again, we, we don't, we're gonna go deeper into React tomorrow. We want you using those DOM manipulation uh, tools today uh, and, and just like we did here with this number guessing game, all of your work should be inside app.jsx. Uh, let me go ahead and stop the recording and, and we can break and, and I can stick around a bit for any questions that, that folks have. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>